I'd like to tell you a story Ed Marquardt helps set the context for our passage. I'll share with you his experience. He said we went out on a family picnic to one of those lovely state parks. The water was so green, so blue-green as it is in the high mountain streams. Water came tumbling down, a white waterfall, and it fell into this deep green pool of water. And there was this giant rock formation jutted out in the middle of that deep green pool. Obviously, this was a great swimming hole. And so just as we were getting ready to dive into that swimming hole of cold water, I noticed a huge salmon, a whole bunch of them, lumbering along the bottom, moving ever so slowly, their noses worn white from the long trip moving up the mountain streams. Their bellies and backs were colored black. They had traveled hundreds of miles, perhaps thousands of miles, to that very swimming hole to spawn. For half an hour, we watched the, these old dogs, old hogs, actually. That's what the fishermen called them, old hogs lumbering like logs along the bottom swirling, preparing to die. He says, you know, these salmon have an instinct inside them to bring them back to their place of birth. After spending two or three years out in the ocean, they come back thousands of miles, perhaps, up the stream of their birth to give birth. And then they must prepare to die. Over rocks and dams and waterfalls, they swim, ending their long, arduous journey. Dig a hole, lay the eggs, and then they die. But out of those eggs come new life. For it is only through their dying that there can be new life born. When Jesus finished his parable, he said, Let the person that has ears to hear, let him understand the riddles of the kingdom of God. The story for today finds Jesus just six days before he dies. How would you feel if you knew for sure you were going to die in six days? This Friday, perhaps. If you knew you were going to, let's say from an illness, you probably would be a bit distracted this week. You might philosophize as Jesus he was preoccupied, contemplating, thinking about what lay ahead. He wasn't watching The Bachelor, playing video games. Only six days. And he's in the city of Jerusalem, and it's Passover, and there are hundreds of thousands of visiting people. Imagine hundreds of thousands of visitors at one time here in Baton Rouge, all gathered together, crammed in together along government, downtown. People from everywhere. That's the way it was. And this, this was little Jerusalem. A wild mass of humanity, and among them were a couple of Greeks. They came up to some disciples to talk to Jesus. They heard perhaps one of them had a Greek accent, Philip from Bethsaida, and Bethsaida was a Greek-speaking city there. In Israel, Greek travelers thought, hey, that guy speaks Greek. He must be one of us. They approached Philip and asked him, can we see Jesus? That's a common thing to ask in John. Can we see Jesus? 
Well, Philip went to Andrew. Two of them went to Jesus and said, there are a couple of Greeks who want to speak with you. Context is set. Now you think he might answer them directly, clearly. But instead, he is distracted, perhaps, preoccupied with his death. Did I say in six days? And so he says this, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it will remain a single seed. But if it dies, it will pr produce many grains of wheat. For whoever will find his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will find it. If anyone would serve me, they must follow me. They must follow me in death. Is that any way to speak to visitors? I hope if you're visiting, we spoke well to you. Maybe, maybe we would shake their hands, give them a hug, invite them back, get them in touch with our newcomers, ministry council. But Jesus' response was different. It was kind of weird, wasn't it? A little strange. These Greeks want to see Jesus, but he's distracted. Maybe that's exactly the perfect response. Because in order to see Jesus, we must see that his living means die. Die. You can almost see his words. He speaks with such vivid imagery. You can smell it too. If you've ever been on a farm or in a garden, planted seeds, you can smell that dark, rich soil. You could see and feel the tiny seeds full of potential. I'm, I'm seeing peach trees, an orchard of peach trees. In the Lorax, a Dr. Seuss book, which became a movie and a play, our son was in seven years ago. There's a character called the Onceler. Maybe you've seen it. The Onceler has chopped down every last tree. Truffula trees. Chopped them all down to make his fneed. It's not easy to say. It's his everything garment. Years later, after all the trees have been chopped down, all gone, the Onceler is visited by a young boy named Ted. Ted desperately wants to grow a tree. You see, he's in love, and he promised a girl he'd grow her a tree. But how? In a moving scene, the onceler carefully hands Ted the last truffula tree seed. It's tiny. Ted reaches for it, this tiny thing, and he holds it between his finger and his thumb, and he says to the onceler, no one cares. No one cares. Then make them care, the onceler says. Plant that seed in the middle of town so everyone can see it growing. Change the way things are he says. Then he says, I know it may seem small and insignificant, but it's not about what it is. It's about what it can become. That's not just a seed any more than you're just a boy. It's not about what it is. It's about what it can become. It's tiny, but it has the potential of becoming much more. It's ordinary, but it has the potential of becoming extraordinary. It's just a man, but he has the potential of becoming a savior. It's just a group of 12, but it has the potential of becoming the church. But it all begins with dying, the seed dying. And could that be the answer? to death, 
that life is death. Truly living is dying. I don't mean sucking air and consuming burgers and vegging out to The Bachelor and video games and baseball games. I'm talking about something deeper, larger, something with more purpose. It is outliving yourself. Outliving yourself. Does your life continue after you've died? I'm not just talking about heaven. I mean that the seed dies producing fruit from the earth. Will your life produce more life? Jesus says unless it dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, then many seeds and much fruit. A tomato seed dies in order to produce a, a full crop of tomatoes. A human life dies in order to produce what? What will your dying produce? What fruit will your life bear? If we have years to live, six days, what we really don't know. How many years do we have? But it's a law of nature, a natural law that St. Francis of Assisi knew well when he wrote in his famous prayer, it is in giving that we receive, it is in dying that we are born again. The Apostle Paul knew that law well when, when he said, we will not be united with Christ in a resurrection like his unless we are first united in a death like his. We ask, where is Jesus? Can we see Jesus? We look around. There is a spiritual principle, a natural law of God at work all around us. The planting season, farmers know. Spring is planting season. Springing with abundance of life. Only when we are united with Christ in death like his are we united in his resurrection. What does it mean? Well, if our dying hasn't been good this past week, neither as our living. If you haven't been dying this week, maybe you haven't been living. We are told in this life to indulge more. Commercials tell us, our friends and community, indulge. So we won't be told by society, you must die in order to live. Jesus was speaking of that physically, actually, and also spiritually, metaphorically. A dying to self, dying to our selfishness, dying to our greed, dying to indulgence, dying to living for me. To living as though we are center of our universe. Jesus said, unless a seed dies, it remains only one. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Dying means dying to our sinfulness as well. Before we can die to our sinfulness, we have to admit we are sinners. Each of us, all of us, not one perfect person in here or out there. The novelist Reynolds Price wrote from a wheelchair, 
because he had a rare spinal cancer that almost killed him back in the 1980s. He wrote a gripping book called A Whole New Life, and he writes about the healing vision of Jesus he had that he credits with saving his life from cancer and from its treatments. While Price survived both of those, he said in this interview with Oxford Review, he was not able to avoid death altogether. He says, when you undergo when you undergo traumas, trauma in middle life, everybody is in league with us denying that old, the old life has ended. He says everybody is trying to patch us up and get us back to who we were. When in fact, what we need to be told is you're dead. Who are you going to be tomorrow? You are dead. Who are you going to be tomorrow? Assuming you want your one life to matter. Assuming you want your short life outlived. Assuming you want your little life to produce much fruit. Plant yourself. Plant it. Die the death of Jesus to live the resurrected life of Jesus. Let go of the potential you clutch in your fist and trust the seeds to God. Let go of the fear of losing this tiny little life. And give it to the one who gives it back a thousandfold. I know it may seem small and insignificant, but it's not about what it is. It's about what it can become. Will you pray with me? God, you know our attempts to serve. That sometimes they are few and far from looking anything like yours. In fact, we can't imagine giving what you gave. It must have been a great love. that you died to give. Lord, give us opportunities to plant our life, to make a difference for you, for your kingdom, and for this world, to bear fruit that is good for others, life-giving kinds of fruit, goodness kinds of fruit. And help us to have the ears to hear the riddle, the eyes to see it, hands to serve it. We pray in Christ. Amen.